You finished law school yeah. and you started a law firm. Yeah, my Jewish grandmothers are very happy. They like <laughs> look at my grandson. But it just, it wasn't what I wanted to yeah. do at all. And it was actually my wife who was like, your dad's always inventing weird shit in the garage. Like maybe that's <laughs> the one. It's like, oh, I have a prototype. And so he shows me how with this one piece of hardware, he can detect even like a drop of water a minute happening on the opposite side of the house. Sure. And now we have the leading product in the space, which is which is great. Ultimately, you get a big investment from Moen. Yeah. In your mind, did you have like a number that you needed personally to get out of this acquisition for you to feel good about it? Yeah, I, I'm, I mean, I did. How many different people, including our Persian friends, have asked you the question? Oh my God. Yeah. What's the appropriate way to ask? The, I, that's, <laughs> so I actually can't share it. He's pretending to have the confidentiality clause. We're going to let him be. Maybe you want to be invisible. I don't know. You You're can, rich now. You can so email it's me. Good I to be. Say, well, there you go again. <laughs> law flip, law flip, objection, your honor. Turn, turn the game upside down. Law flip, law flip, objection, your honor. Welcome to Law Flip. It's a conversation about law, life, water, leak detection, and everything in between. So I'm Benji Smith. And if you want to learn how to build a company, scale it, and get acquired, this is the episode for you. So my house, two different times, two different times have had major water leaks causing hundreds of thousands of dollars of damage and untold amounts of emotional pain. And this person right here, he came up with the solution to that pain point. He took the pain point of water damage and came up with a brilliant solution, scaled the company, and got it acquired. We want to welcome Gabe Halimi. What's up, man? Thanks for having me, Benji. Thank you so much. Okay, so let's flip the game upside down. Don't forget to subscribe to us everywhere, at Lawflip. Go do it. It helps us, please, at YouTube, on the social media networks. Do it all. And then you can call us with any legal questions whatsoever. One eight three three Lawflip. Welcome, Gabe. Thank you so much for having me. I forgot about the water damage in your home, by the way. Yeah. Until you it, just said that, and, and I it's remember. Funny, you had me film some testimonials, and That's I feel right. like I was not on for those testimonials. No, you did a great job. Those were so helpful. But I remember you. You had you had a really bad Brutal. situation in your house. Brutal. Yeah, and, and you were really kind bad. enough to help out. Okay. So you're born and raised in L.A. Yep. Born and raised in L.A. You um, went to Beverly Hills High School. Went to Beverly Hills Schools. Graduated from Beverly. You see Santa Barbara, go Gauchos, and you then the, and then you went to Loyola, where we we both we went to Loyola up. Law School. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great okay. School. So you, you you finished law school, yeah, and you go sort of the more traditional route. Don't you started a law firm? Yeah, but even even before then, like I always knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. So you I was did. like, I was trying to decide what tool do I want in my tool belt for when I go become an entrepreneur, right? And uh -huh. then you kind of have two routes. You're either going to business school or you're going to law school. Yeah. And I'm like, well, law school is far more practical, yeah. right? I, I mean, from my perspective, so. I went to law school at night. That was a big reason why I went to That's Loyola because right. they had the evening program. Mm -hmm. And I was working full time during the day. What were you I, doing? I, I ran a tool business for a period of time. My dad bought a plumbing business and I was operating a tool company. So I you dabbled ended up doing like bit. water leak detection. You ran a, a tool company. I can't be the first person to, to tell you that like Persian and water leak detection and tool companies, they don't necessarily no. come to mind. No, they don't. I mean, my... My dad is kind of a rare breed and he's he's an engineer. He had a plumbing manufacturing plant. And so he was always like the kind of, uh, you know, he always was a little bit different. He's a yeah. very innovative guy. He's always inventing things. And so I never planned on working with him, but this experience I actually had during law school was pretty amazing. So like we ha were the subsidiary off of a plumbing business. And while I'm there, we are managing tons of claims from the plumbing industry. So the mm. plumbing manufacturer had a bunch of plumbing liability, like subrogations, because these connectors that they would manufacture, what connects like a toilet to a water supply line or faucet to a water supply line, they would rupture. And even if they ruptured 15, 20 years later, they were getting claims from the insurance company, like you guys are responsible, you guys manufactured this part. So I wasn't even thinking about it at the time, but I was kind of like also the claims manager for this plumbing business. That's crazy. And, and seeing then, like this is a freaking massive problem. And we're talking about billions of dollars every single year, leading cause of homeowners insurance claims every single year in the United States. And it was actually during this time 2007, so this yeah. is while we were both at Loyola, catastrophic water damage in our own home. Mm. So my 
in, in my parents' home. I was living at home at the time. And people don't understand, like when you have water damage. That's it. The water is running uncontrollably yeah. and it is flooding your house. Yeah. If you're lucky enough to get home like fast enough, great, you can turn it off. But like we were in New York for the weekend, three days from the second story, <laughs> water running uncontrollably. Um, so we, we had this experience firsthand that you had. And my dad happened to be the innovative guy. He happened to be the engineer in the plumbing space. And he's like, I'm going to solve this problem. So this and is I'm 207 like, when you're still in school, way before you start school, the company. I pat my dad on the back. I'm like, dad, you go do that. That sounds awesome. <laughs> I'm going to go back on this track over here and do all these other things. So you go, to, you, um, you go and you work, you get out of law school and you work, work at out of law school, practice law for a period of time with uh, Reigns Law Group, yeah. the Reigns Feldman guys who are phenomenal. I'm like three years in, I've kind of made partner with them because they're a startup law firm. My, That's my, a quick track. My Jewish grandmothers are very happy. They like look at my <laughs> grandson. But it just, it wasn't what I wanted to yeah. do at all. You know, I really wanted to go operate. I wanted to be more entrepreneurial. So um, Sam Nazarian gave me a great opportunity to go at Umami, help right? run Umami, yeah. right? He had just partnered with Adam Fleischman. There was like no infrastructure in that joint venture. Uh, so I quickly was like helping to operate that whole company. It was a phenomenal experience for me. And after like three, three and a half years of doing that, I had just got married. I'm in I'm at my honeymoon with my wife. We're like somewhere in Thailand having an awesome time. And I'm like, I'm done. I, I really want to do something different. I feel like I'm ready to like start a company and I'm like racking my brain on what to do. And it was actually my wife who was like, your dad's always inventing weird shit in the garage. Like maybe <laughs> one of these like inventions that your dad, you know, has come up with, maybe that's the one. I was like, oh, okay. And Behind so, every great man. Yeah, dude, she's wow. amazing. And, Unbelievable. Well, in my case, I have a great wife and I have a great dad. So I have that two. That is incredible. So I go back. This is like early 2015 after my honeymoon. And I go back. I'm like, dad, that plumbing invention that you wanted to do after we had water damage, like where are you at with that? And he's like, oh, I have a prototype. And so he shows me how with this one piece of hardware, he can detect even like a drop of water a minute happening on the opposite side of the house. And this is like in the middle of like this IoT revolution. You have like Nest that just sold to Google for $3 billion. And we're also in like our fifth or fourth, fourth or fifth straight year of emergency drought conditions yep. in California. You know, it was a very relevant problem. So he to builds be like the sort of like minimum viable product for the hardware. Yeah. And then you did the ambitious thing, right? Because building a software is tough, building a hardware is tough. You yeah. did a tech enabled hardware yes so he builds this this uh hardware minimum viable product right and where was the technology at that point and, and it was it very from? early like okay. it, it was really early it needed a lot of work but what he had done which was pretty amazing is he took this like flow sensor temperature sensor pressure sensor the the ball valve that you need to turn on and turn off the water like he he got all of that in one embodiment right that was a, at a pretty cost effective price point. And so once he did that, I'm like, okay, we need to overlay all this technology. I have no idea how to do it, but that's okay because we can be very resourceful. And so I just I started talking to people. I just started networking all over LA and we're, we're very blessed in this, in the, you know, LA to have, I mean, we're one or two degrees of separation yep. away from some phenomenal entrepreneurs, right? So for me, I was able to get in front of like Jamie Simonoff from, from Ring. Ring, uh, yeah. You know, he, he would, he just finished his series A or something. He was already on Shark Tank, just started taking off. Was the idea that you were trying to get funding before you even started? Or you well, were just trying to get some ideas? I knew I had ideas? to get funding. I knew I had to get funding. But I didn't even know where to start at this point. So, like, I just I just started networking and talking to, like, my other buddies who had started companies. Like, I talked to Mikey and Danny Baruchim who were running, you know, FabFitFun mm -hmm. Um, a bunch of people like that. And so they just started, I, I just started getting connected to the right people. Jason Nazar, who also went to uh, UC Santa Barbara, he'd already sold his company to Intuit. He ended up becoming one of my earliest advisors, investors, sat on my board, you know, we're still really close today. And he just started introducing me to a bunch of people that I needed to meet, like who's the right outside CTO for me to even like start creating the architecture of what I needed. So the first first point of the day is, Find the people that have done the thing that you want to do. Find the people who are going to be committed to your success. Like find the right advisors. Be humble. Don't be shy. Like you don't know what you don't know. And like for the for the entrepreneurs that pretend like they know they know it all and they have a plan, like there's no plan when you're first starting out. Your plan is going to change daily. You're going to keep 
pivoting and iterating, but like finding the people that have kind of like been there, done that to some extent. And there's, and there may be no one that's perfect. Like Jamie was perfect from like a smart home perspective, like how to navigate those waters and help build the kind of user experience that people wanted and whatnot. Jason had just done the early stage startup thing. I got a couple of guys on the plumbing side who knew how to build like the plumbing product and what kind of certifications we need and whatnot. So like, I just quickly created my own little board of advisors. And w were you having to give out pieces of the company at that point or is literally just like be people being good people and helping you out? I was frugal, right? Like, so a lot of times people were just kind of helping me out. But when I found the right people that I really needed committed, like I knew I needed to sit down with these people ongoing, weekly, bi-weekly, even monthly, and I really needed them committed. What I did was I gave them equity, right? And I wanted to make sure it was something meaning, like if they were the right person, I wanted to make sure it was something meaningful for them, that it moved the needle that they felt like they were also committed to my success. And there were a ton of people who were just friends that I would just pick up the phone and call once every few months. And for those guys, they were happy just to have a conversation and give me some advice. But find those people, like find your Jamie, find your Jason, yeah. find the people who are really going to be committed to your success and just don't let them go. Like let them, you know what I mean? Like incentivize them in your growth. Okay, working with your dad. Yeah. That's a tough thing. I work with my dad. Um, how how do you do that successfully? The most important thing that we did was we divided up where our responsibilities were going to lie and and who was going to run the thing. Like we decided it was it, it wasn't easy. We decided that like I was going to be the CEO and I was going to make the day-to-day -day decisions. I was going to run the business. But my dad was essentially like the chief, you know, engineer of the company. Yeah. He was like the CTO. Like I didn't question his decisions, like he kind of had final say from like an engineering standpoint, right? So I brought on the right advisors, but he would kind of stress test and I would try to move it in the right direction. But ultimately like the engineering side was kind of his. And then he was also the chairman of the board. So we would mm. joke around that like the one decision that he could make as the chairman is whether or not to fire <laughs> me. <laughs> he great. didn't, so that was good. But like, I, I mean, we had to divide up yeah. our roles or else we would just be butting heads. We're like way too much alike. So. So you're able, clearly you're able to successfully do that. Okay, so then. Yeah, I mean, we had a bunch of blow ups along of the course, way, but yeah, I of mean, course. it worked. We talked about funding, getting funding, figuring out funding, when to take it, when not to take it. What was your experience and what's your advice on just the concept of funding? It's a little chicken or the egg. Like just on the way over here, you saw me in the street, like, yeah. like in the car talking, I was giving advice to another startup. Like, first of all, as the CEO, you're the chief storyteller. You're telling your story of your company constantly like you're weaving together your story the problem space and why you're the one to solve whatever problem it is that you're coming to the market to right um and then it's a little chicken or egg between like well when do i fundraise i need to fundraise so i can hire the people and then a lot of times the vcs will tell you well who's going to execute on this you need the people before you can get the money right um and you're storytelling to both of them. So you're explaining to your to the team that you want to recruit, like, here's why we're going the way that we are. And, you, you know, and I'm going to go raise the money for us to do that. But I need you kind of committed that when I raise the money, you're coming on. And then you're also telling like the VCs or the angels or whoever you're going to, like, here's the, here's the team that's going to do this. What a lot of people don't tell you about fundraising is that it does not happen overnight. You have to be, and it's, it's sort of like hiring your team. You got to be talk to, talking to people and planting seeds long before you actually need that check. Where do you go? So, Who do you talk to? I want to go fundraise for, for an idea. You get introduced to people. You get yourself in front of as many angels as you can. And it's like anything else. Like you are networking. So, now you had a, so, uh, so, so for example, even it, like if you find a, a VC that has invested in a somewhat similar space, similar app, and maybe interested in terms of like what you're doing, right? You want to get in front of them as soon as possible just to let them know what you're doing. Like you haven't started, but perhaps you haven't started a technology company before, right? But what you want to be telling them is like, here's what I'm setting out to do. And over the next three months, here's, here, here's what I plan to do. Here's some of the deliver. They're not even asking you. You're just telling them like, here's what I'm going to execute on over the next few months. I'm not ready for your check yet <laughs> because these are the things that I need to do, but I'm going to come back. It's a court. You're building a relationship. Business is all relationships. You're building relationships with team members. You're building relationships with potential clients. You're building relationships with investors. So you're planting seeds along the way of like, this is this is my direction. I'm telling a story. Here's where I'm going in the next three months, six months, I'm coming back to you. And you know what? Every check-in you do with that investor 
you know, they're kind of taking note like, oh yeah, this guy said he was going to do this and he's actually doing it. Mm. All right. He's actually building some momentum. You don't just show up at someone's door who doesn't know you and say, you know, give me money. This is what I'm doing. You had a thing where you kind of had a, probably a patented type product. Mm -hmm. So you probably didn't have to worry at all about people knocking it off. Or maybe you did. That's not true. That's yeah, not true. Okay, there right. we go. Yeah. Bad assumption, as they yeah. say in law, yeah. that lacks foundation. Having IP is great. I mean, investors are very interested to know that you have some kind of IP. But even, even you know, as an attorney, you're an attorney too, like trying to prosecute you know, intellectual property claims, Very tough. extremely difficult. So what you're actually getting when you have IP is you have some level of comfort right. that another person is not already doing what you're doing, right. right? Like that's great. Having some kind of like a shield that if someone comes after you, you're like, hey, what, it, like what I did here is defensible yeah. because I have my own IP. I've had other entrepreneurs, lawyers tell me, don't worry at all about, um, about sharing your idea with as many people as you want. There's, you know, they have to go execute it. They're not gonna, anybody who's worth copying you and doing it better than you, they've already, they're already busy enough on doing their own stuff. And then uh, do you feel the same way? Like, did, were you worried about telling people and no. then copying you? And I going, was never worried about competition. Yeah. In fact, having competition in my space at the time was actually very reassuring that it's like, okay, like I'm not the only one that sees this massive problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, there are, hundreds of millions of homes in the United States. There's billions across the world. Anyone that has a plumbing system needs some kind of a solution like this in their home eventually. So the market size is huge. If I get 5% of the market, we're a multi-billion dollar company. So I don't, I, I wasn't caught up with the, you know, to competition. I was like, the more competition, the better. Obviously I wanted to win. Sure. And now we have the leading product in the space, which is, which is great. Incredible. Um, and the, 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 the product is, it's a leak detection system. Oh yeah. We didn't even get into yeah. that. So yeah. So let's go back. So it's a water monitoring and leak detection system for the home. So yeah. there's hardware, there's software, and there's an app. So the hardware gets installed on the main water supply line to the home. And it's essentially learning how that home uses water. It's monitoring the flow of the water, the pressure of the water, and the temperature of the water, the three fluid mechanical elements. Then it also has an actuated ball valve with just a fancy way of saying it can turn on and turn off your water. It's connected to the Wi-Fi. So as it's learning, it's running these like machine learning algorithms. When does Benji take his showers? Like how often does he flush the toilet? Pretty like often. It just, it basically, yeah, it just basically <laughs> learns all this stuff. And every home is, is going to be different. Yeah. And so once it kind of learns what's normal for your home, when it sees something go out of whack, water's running for too long of a period of time, your pressure is too high. Pressure's a really big deal. The same way you worry about high blood pressure because that's a telltale sign that other parts of your body you know, are working too hard or could fail. Water pressure is the same way. You have water pressure too high, it's above 100 PSI. At some point, something is gonna burst. Your, your pipes are not meant to sustain that kind of pressure. So we're learning all this stuff. You have an app that is essentially, you can see how much water you're using, you can set conservation goals, see how much of your water is going to your toilet versus your shower versus your irrigation, whatever. And then if something really dangerous happens or you actually have a pipe burst, you get the notification, it can shut off your water automatically, or you can turn off your water. The great thing about this is that there's no shortage of advocates for having a technology like this in a home. You have, you know, your water utility who also wants to encourage you to use less water. Your water is getting more expensive. So like, you know, you're, you're interested in saving money insurance on water. Insurance carriers. And then the insurance industry. Yeah. That's the big one. Like yeah. this is the leading cause of preventable homeowner's insurance claims every year. So a lot of people get homeowner's insurance thinking I need this because, you know, there could be a robbery, you know, there could be a fire. Water damage is twice as likely as having those things combined. So yeah, it's like, it's the, I mean, this is the big, this it's is common the big killer. and the worst. Yeah. It's, um, it's a huge pain in the ass. So I've been involved in some startups and they're incredibly, it's incredibly hard to figure out how to spend your time. Yeah. And I think that what you did was you have a startup, which is tough in general. Then you have a technology, very tough. Then you have a, a hardware, very tough. You put it all together. You're the perfect person to ask, how the heck do you go from the startup phase? What are the things that you did to juggle that balancing act between the hardware, the software, tech, sales, marketing, advertising, yeah. HR, all these things to become the successful product or the successful business that ends up getting acquired. Yeah, I mean, probably the most fun part for me, like I love multitasking. I love having a different 
set of problems to kind of deal with every day. And there's no shortage of that when you're a startup entrepreneur, right? So it's like prioritizing every day what I'm going to work on. Some days I was writing an employee manual. Other days I was out pitching an insurance company. Another day I was like architecting and designing our app, right? The most important thing to remember though, is you, you actually can't do this all yourself. You have to have, you have to have a great team of people behind you. So, you know, you're always looking to hire even for what the next job is that you're going to need even before I have it. So very similar to the fundraising conversation where I'm like, look, you're actually fundraising six months out, wherever you are from your app right now, if you think that, okay, I'm going to be ready to start fundraising at this stage, you should be talking to people right now and planting the seed that I'm going to be here at this time. That's when I'm going to be ready. Start taking note of my success. You want to hire the right kind of talent. You're kind of doing the same thing. You're out networking with people now saying, here's where I'm going. I'm solving this really big problem. I can use a guy like you. I know you're out here. You have a family. You can't bet on a startup. I get it. But at some point, these are the kind of users I'm going to have. This is the kind of milestones I'm going to be hitting. And I am going to have that kind of funding. So you're actually that's doing the that? Kind of like you were going to these different, you were going after talent. I was constantly were- meeting people. I was uh-huh. constantly meeting people. I didn't know where the conversations were going to go. But like, People could either become great advisors for me. They could introduce me to great, you know, uh, to investors that I might need, um, or they were a talent that I was eventually able to. Recruit. It took me, it took me two and a half years to recruit who's my current CFO. Wow! Like on the side, he was moonlighting for me, helping to do some of my initial modeling that I put in front of my seed investors. Again, he helped me with my Series A when I was like doing all the financing you know, and stuff for that. By the time the series B rolled around, he, he, he finally came on board. And I'm assuming that when you did all these rounds and ultimately get, get acquired, you're leaning on all these advisors. Cause you don't know what, I mean, you, you're, you're a smart dude. You went to law school, but like to have that, to carry that weight that yeah. like you could make the wrong decision. Listen, you got to follow your instincts too. I mean, there's no silver bullet. There sure. isn't necessarily like a right answer. Like if someone had done this before and it was easy, they would have already done it. Sure. You know what I mean? So no one knows your business as an entrepreneur better than you do. However, you know, you want to collect facts, you want to collect facts and you want to make good decisions. And so sometimes that advice would come from my investors who were, who were like my, you know, advisors, they might as well have been like, that's why I chose some of the investors that I chose or fought like hell to get them because they could help me with what I was doing. Sometimes that advice comes from your team members. Mm-hmm. Like, so I was, I was getting different data points and then you would just have to make a decision and go. Like, what was the hardest part? What was the hardest part of building the company? Ugh, fundraising. fundraising. Fundraising is tough. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Fundraising is really tough. I mean, it's, it's just grueling. Like you get a, you know, you get a hundred no's before you get a yes from like, you know, to the right person. Because yeah, people look at you, they probably look at, you've had a couple of rounds. Oh, it was easy for the guy. He just, he oh, just it, raised no, money not, a couple of times and then got acquired. It's fucking brutal, man. Yeah. It's, and, and it's, it's never easy. Anyone that says fundraising is easy. Like it's not, it's really hard. There's like due diligence. There's a ton of questions. Like you, you start doubting yourself in the process. <laughs> like, you know, you know, you're, you're trying to find the right balance between convincing people like this could be a billion dollar company with like, okay, like, what are you going to do tomorrow? That's going to like, you know, that's going to be a step in the right direction. So yeah, that's, that, that was hard. And I had never done it before. That's the one part that I had never done. I'd had employees before, like I had a product team before it, I'd I'd ran operations and different things before. And with technology, I was able to get the right advisors, but like, as a CEO, like you have to be the one fundraising. And no what about the, so it. the fundraising is like the the larger, tougher thing, but what about just prioritizing the pain points of your own business? So you every day probably got complaints from literally every aspect of your business, whether it be the customers complaining about it not working well enough, whether it be HR complaints. How did you personally figure out how to spend your time? Like I got this advice actually from Jason Nazar, take a sticky note every morning. And what are the three to five things that you can do today that can really move the business forward? Yeah. Because there's constantly noise. People are trying to pull you in a bunch of different directions. And that means that sometimes you're, you know, you're not going to be responding to your email. You're going to avoid your text message. You're not going to get dinner, have lunch plans with your friend, like whatever. Like you just, you got to stay really focused because you set the tone for the whole rest of the company. If you show up at 9 a.m., that's when other people are going to show up. If you leave at 5, that's more than likely not when other people are going to leave, right? And they take their cues from you. Like I would do a stand-up every morning. Uh, with the team and I would tell them like, here are the things I'm working on today. And I would have other people go around and say what they're working on. And like, 
to let other people hear, like hold each other accountable on like, okay, is that really just noise? It's also hard as an attorney, right? As an attorney, you're kind of trained to think in a lot of ways of like, how am I going to minimize risk? What are all the things that could go wrong? Qualifying every statement. You have to like almost unlearn that yeah. when you when you when you become an entrepreneur because now you're constantly like you're the storyteller you're the one out front you're the one that's moving the business forward and you almost have to like ignore a lot of that you know uh, but a lot of that stuff so like, the, yeah, probably it, the most important thing you can do yeah. sorry it's just no. you got to build momentum like it, it's all about momentum when you're starting a business and that's why when you go and you tell that investor or you tell that employee like or potential employee Here's where I'm going to be in six months. Now you got a bunch of people that are also holding you accountable and are looking over your shoulder as the entrepreneur. Then you're waking up in the morning. Okay, I've made these commitments. I said, this is where I'm going. What are the three to five things I'm going to do today that are going to help me reach that goal? Because your number one job as a CEO is your storytelling. And then you're also, you're also the chief fundraiser. You mm. don't have the capital. You don't, you don't live to fight another day. No businesses stop operations when they have millions of dollars in the bank. They don't do that, right? Yeah. So yeah, it's I like, don't think I, I don't think there's enough emphasis on that. You know, you'd like to think that you can grow a business organically and get to revenue really easily, but that wasn't your your experience no, was. Yeah. No, I mean it was for us it was it was ridiculously hard because we also had to get a plumber out to someone's home to go install a technology. The guy Tim, was Tim. Tim, Tim, you, oh, Tim, Tim, Tim Brock. Yeah, he's yeah that's guy. our boy. He's still on the team. He's yeah. awesome. Yeah, he's awesome. Um, so ultimately, you get a big investment from Moen, right? It's a it's a large, is it a multi multi? Yeah, so, so Moen is a subsidiary of Fortune Brands Home yeah. and Security. They let our series B, uh, which was at the end of 2018. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was like magic. Like I was lucky to have some really good strategic investors like, USAA became an investor, Nationwide Insurance became an investor. But ultimately, like when my VCs asked me, and this is a question that a VC will always ask you at some point, they'll be like, where's the exit? How, how, how's the VC getting paid in the end of the day? They're, either, they're only getting paid one of two ways. Either you're selling the company or you're going public. Like those are, you know, those are the two ways that they're really cashing out and they're making a return mm-hmm. for their LP investors. You got to sure. think the way they think, right? Sure. They have like five to 10 year investment horizons, right? So when my VC asked me, how are we gonna get paid? Like, where's the exit gonna come? I'm like, the best exit for this company will come from a forward thinking plumbing company who realizes that like, this is a must have for their portfolio, given the way the plumbing industry is going. Plumbing is a black box. And like, in your mind, did you have a like a number that you needed personally to get out of this acquisition for you to feel good about it or you were ju- you just wanted to see what was out there yeah and- i i'm i mean i did i had a minimum for like like we were talking about about roi earlier sure. right so i was like for every year that i'm working on this i had a number in mind of like okay this is at a minimum what i need to get out and i discounted that quite a bit considering i was having so much fun doing what i was doing i felt like it was a once in a lifetime opportunity because i was building a company with my dad, which yep. was like so cool. It was in a relevant space. I felt like I was learning a lot. So like for me, it was like, okay, how much would I be making if I would be working at like, you know, a big company and doing really well? And like, that was how much I was thinking like, okay, I needed to make this a year. Obviously like I, many, I did better than that. So that was great. How many, how many different people, including our Persian friends have asked you the question? Oh my God. Yeah. Is there is there is there any that haven't asked you the question? No, yeah, there are there, there are some that haven't. What's the, asked what's you the, the appropriate way to ask the question? Because that's, <laughs> I mean, it's 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 a I tough actually one. I so, so I actually can't share it because it's like you know this is a public company that but acquired our business. You know, since I have like per, even though I'm not truly Persian, even You're, I kind of you have might like, as well be. You might so as well. Like, be. I, I know the crowd least, you run I, with. I don't think my Persian friends would have been okay if we got Had through this without at least like broaching the topic. So I did my thing. You guys, yeah, saw you, you guys saw I it. You guys saw it. You asked the question. Benji did what he to do. He's pretending to have the confidentiality clause. We're going to let him be. And now, <laughs> finally, tell the people the the toughest parts about your journey. Yeah. I mean, being an entrepreneur is very lonely. It is. It's really hard because all of that weight is on your shoulders. You know, by that point, you maybe have employees. You know, you're processing payroll. The money's going down. You're trying to keep up. Um you, you just, you just got to believe, man, you got to believe and you got to have the right support network. Like you need a, 
you need a partner, whether it's a partner in your business, you know, your, 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 your spouse, like you need people that you can lean on and you need to know when you need to take a break because it never, that, that your, your responsibilities and the stuff on your to-do list will never be over. It will never be over. There were, oh, there's an unlimited number of things that you can do to move your business forward. So one of the most important things to do is like, you got to know when you just got to take a break. Like you, you got to know when you need to check out and you definitely have to do that as That's an hard entrepreneur. To do. It's you hard got, to do. You, How'd you do but it? But you have to. Um, look, I, I also like having a family actually really helped Forces because there you. were times that like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to not take a vacation with my wife and kids. Yeah. Like that's, you know, I have to do that. Um, keeping, keeping a date night with my wife, you know what I mean? Having at least like once a month that I would like get together with a certain group of friends, like, you know, something that like just keeps you grounded outside of what you're doing and reminds you that like life, life still goes on. Right. And so you gotta, you gotta do things that are going to help you find that balance because you will burn out. In the business, what was the toughest? I know you said fundraising was really hard, but in the day to day grind, what were the things that you just like dreaded? I mean, look, I hated sitting in meetings. Like, I would sit around, and when we have like a big meeting and there are 10 people sitting in a room, I'm just thinking of how like the productivity is just plummeting because 10 people in a room because because there's going to be five or six people that are just sitting there because they feel like they need to be there or whatever. Like, I, I just, I'm, I'm a, I'm, I'm a hawk for productivity. I'm a hawk for like efficiencies. Right. And so, um, at, I don't know if that was the worst thing, but that's just something that would just, you know, annoy the shit out how of did, me. How did you optimize productivity? Keep groups small and like delegate on the of a decision making, like empower people who know whatever they're doing the best to just run with it. Like what did it take, me to, get, what did it take to get your confidence? Cause you have high expectations, yeah, right? Yeah. For me, like one of the things that I struggle with is like when I'm in meetings with people and they don't ask questions, yeah. they just like listen. Yeah. And you're like, are yeah. you completely no, checked like, out? Are you listening? Like, you know, quiz them, yeah. you know, the Socratic method, <laughs> like fucking law school. Like, no, seriously, <laughs> just like make sure people are listening to you and like make, make your, make your definition of what success looks like, make those metrics very clear and always have a follow up kind of coming out of the meeting, right? It's like, okay. This is done by Thursday, kind of here's here's what I'm looking for. Here's how I'm defining success. Are there any questions? And then you're holding keep people accountable. Trust but verify, right? Yeah. Like, you, you know, so I would, I would welcome people running. Like I welcome strong leaders who wanted to make a name for themselves. Like that was another thing with my team members. One of my most important interview questions was like, where are you going? Like what's, what's, what's your journey, Benji? Like you're sitting here right now. If we work together, you will have come from one place. I will have come from another place. And for some period of time, we will be on a journey together. And then after that, you're going to go one way and I'm going to go one way. Mm. The days of like us working in the same company for 25 years and getting a retirement watch and we're like, it's over. That's wow, how you it were, works, that, right? That's an interesting so, approach. No. So I, I would ask people, I'm like, okay, like if you come work here for three to five years, whatever, that's like best case scenario, right? Awesome. <laughs> where are you going next? Where, where can you get to? And here's a great example. The guy that was like the first engineer I ever hired, his name is Jihan Yukar. And I looked at him and he was like senior manager kind of level at like the last company that he was at, but a very ambitious guy, phenomenal engineer. And I was like, this look- This is a traditional engineer or a tech engineer? Yeah, 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 tech engineer, okay. software, uh, software engineer. And I told him in our first conversation, like, look, like I want you to come work for the company. Like kind of what is it going to take? Because he already had some success in startups and whatnot. And I was like, look, like I don't plan on hiring a CTO right now. I'm hiring you. We have some advisors who are helping create the architecture and whatnot. And I just told him, I'm like, don't give me a reason to hire a CTO. Like, don't give me a reason to hire someone above you. <laughs> like, don't be an asshole. If you don't know something, tell me you don't know how to do it. Let's go get the right answer together. But I will keep investing in your growth because he made very clear to me, like, he wanted to eventually start his own company. He definitely wanted to be a CTO. That's where he felt like he was going. And I'm like, look, stick with me. And I'm absolutely committed to you getting there. And wow. he, he left the company over the summer after we were acquired. No hard feelings. There wasn't the right place for him within the Fortune brand structure after we got acquired. And now he's the co-founder and CTO of another startup. I can't talk about it. It's stealth, but I'm also an investor in the company. And like, 
you know, that's amazing. You know, I'm stoked for him. And that's amazing. I mean, he actually came through, and so many people disappoint. But you gotta, you gotta believe. And there will be people there that more also people, disappoint along the way. But there are people like him. There are people that you could trust. Sometimes you can get you can get frustrated by the fact that like, oh, there's nobody I can trust. There are people that they can trust. Absolutely. And you gotta find those people. And a lot of them are gonna be a lot of them are gonna be referred to you, right? Yeah. Like. Jamie, like I told him, I told Jamie Simonoff what I was looking for. Like, I need a great support person. And he had a guy that he was going to hire for some random position. Didn't know if it was a great fit, but he just loved this guy. And he's like, you know what? He's going to do. There's so much more upside for him. Like he was committed to his growth. His name is Vince Santos. Still works for me. Oh, I've seen he's him copied of, on emails. Vince. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. No, you, you, you definitely met Vince. <laughs> so like Vince joined as our head of support and he never gave me a reason to hire anyone. I think he's hired more people into the company than anyone. That's he's incredible. a phenomenal human being. And um, so like I, I just got really committed in the growth of certain people in my company. So I have a lot more questions and I could, like I said before, I can do a Joe Rogan style interview with you, but what we're going to do Anytime, is- Anytime, I'd love to do that. <laughs> when, I, when I sell my app, when I or when you make your next move, we'll smoke a blunt and do a long form Joe Rogan style interview. Yeah. And right now we're going to legal tip of the month. This is sponsored by Smith & Benowitz. It's a personal injury employment and class action law firm. So one of the things that's shocking, as our friend Ben Madahi once some, sometimes says, is that employees come to us and they literally do not know the employer that they were working for. They do not know the name of the employer. They go, they work on a construction site or they work somewhere and they don't receive a pay stub. They receive maybe some cash for a few days. So here's the deal. If you work for a company, preserve the evidence, keep the evidence of anything, the, the shirts, the hopefully you have a pay stub, a check, anything, because you will need it if and when your employer does wrong by you and you come to a firm like ours and we're happy to help. So preserve the evidence, all the evidence related to your employment, and hopefully you know the name of your employer. Gabe. Yes, it was incredible to have you on. Please give us some parting words and where people can find you because they're going to reach out to you six months in advance. So give us your parting <laughs> words and where people can find you. Six months in advance. That's yeah. good. Sign they learned here. Uh, they can find me. Well, our company is uh, Flow Technologies. Now we're part of uh, Fortune Brands Home and Security. You want me to give like an email address? Or, like, what you How do you want to be contacted? Maybe you don't want to be contacted. Yeah, I mean, Maybe you want to be invisible. I don't know. You You're can, rich now. You can so email it's me. Good to it's good yeah. There you go again. Um, <laughs> no, you can you can you can email me, especially just 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 put in the subject line law flip and I will open the email. That's fair. Uh, Gabriel.halimi at gmail.com. You can wow. email me if you have questions. Oh, we get to personal stuff. email. That's amazing. Yeah, no, okay. email me. Huge. I, I, no, honestly, like I really want to help. I believe in networks. I believe in, you know, you gotta have the right resources and the right advisors if you're gonna start a company. And I've been I've really been blessed with so many good people that have helped me along the way. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to try to pay that forward if I can. Amazing. Thank you so much, man. Hey, thank you, brother. Law flip, law flip, objection, your honor. Turn, turn the game upside down. Law flip, law flip, objection, your honor. Turn the, turn the game upside down. Connect with us on Instagram. We're at law flip. If you have any legal issues, connect with us at Smith Benowitz or smithbenowitz.com. Lawflip is produced by Blue Crescent Media. You can learn more about BCM at bluecrescentmedia.com. Our intro music is provided by Pen Practice, and our Lawflip identity was created by Garrett Whiston and Travis Nagel. And lastly, this podcast is made available by Smith & Benowitz for educational and entertainment purposes only. By listening to this podcast, you understand that no attorney-client relationship is being formed between you and Smith & Benowitz or any of its attorneys. This podcast should not be used as a substitute for competent legal advice from a licensed professional attorney in your state. To the extent this podcast may be considered an advertisement, Benjamin Smith is the attorney responsible for this advertisement. Thank you.